Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar novel review. This is going to be my spoiler review for The Legacy of Yang Chen, Book 4 Chronicles of the Avatar, the second Yang Chen novel. So you've probably already seen my uh, non-spoiler review. This will be full spoilers, so um, I'll be pretty much getting straight into the big stuff immediately. So if you don't want to be spoiled on the book, uh, uh, wait until, of course, the 18th when the book uh, officially, you know, releases everywhere. It's fully available. Um, otherwise, I will be pretty much getting straight down into the details. I will also say just at the very start here that... Um, I won't be able to cover everything in just this one video. So, of course, I will be doing uh, starting my chapter analysis series on this book uh, very soon. So you'll see, I think, at least the first two of them uh, this week um, for like the preview uh, chapters. And then we'll be getting into it much more kind of heavily starting uh, next week with the release of the book. But yeah, let's get in here. So, um... Like I said before, it, I enjoy the book. Um, it, th that's the important thing to kind of get across here. I do have some frustrations, like I talked about yesterday, with aspects of some of the details, which we're going to get into here, about like uh, mystery kind of stuff being revealed, uh, the kind of way they do and approach the kind of ending of the book, and is it sort of satisfying enough to leave off the Yang Chen era for like, who knows how long it will be until we come back to it. Um, there's definitely, I think, some messiness with the plotting uh, as we enter the kind of final section of this book. Um, but what is strong throughout is the character work. And I think if you latch on to Yang Chen as a character, Kavik as a character, you're going to have a good time, I think, regardless of kind of how the other kind of aspects of the book uh, end up going. So, um, getting into the details immediately here. So, um, some of the early stuff that's quite interesting in the book is... Um, one thing is that uh, Yang Chen goes to the north, uh, Northern Water Tribe, to uh, meet with uh, High Chieftain uh, Oil Look. So you do get a scene with him, and it's a really interesting scene because um, she talks quite openly with him um, because he's he's definitely willing willing to listen about the whole platinum affair and what happened. And there's some fascinating stuff that ends up coming out here, and it's not it's not a huge reveal necessarily, but it's it's just this idea that. It wasn't my idea. Oyaluk says that it wasn't his idea to side with um, General uh, Nong against Feishan. It also wasn't Fire Lord Ganryu's idea. It was actually something that just came from their advisors. Yang Chen is kind of shocked to overhear that it was just sort of this thing where it's a similar story with both. That they both were just kind of discussing with their advisors over Pai Shou. They kind of casually mentioned that like oh if we support this general this would happen and he kind of just went along with it and it's just the 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 casual nature of them playing politics on this level playing the full-on you know like kind of game of thrones here uh with this and this is what effectively caused the platinum affair and oil look of course hugely regrets what happened because of what ended up happening but of course has to attempt to be a strong leader in what has happened kind of coming out of this so you you very much get the impression if if Feishan wasn't as ruthless of a leader as he was and um, there would be a little bit more kind of rational thought here a little bit more reasonability from a lot of these characters and we might be able to fix the relationship between everyone but because the expectation is that Feishan will strike at a moment's notice they have to have their kind of defenses up and there's no real kind of room for anything to kind of work so i, I thought that was, that's a really interesting scene that like gives you just this kind of insightful look into oil look and like the only scene that you really kind of get with him just to know that like yeah it was mostly my advisors and, and in a way like that's kind of part of the whole takeaway from both yang chen books it's the the kind of meddling of these kind of not even super highly ranked people but just people with ambition who think they know best and recommending the wrong thing and how what if you do influence a leader what it can actually cause to happen um fascinating stuff on the way out of this meeting she walks away from him and he is kind of he almost meekly kind of calls out to her and it's just like you know is he okay like is akudan my cousin okay and yang chen is just like yes he's doing okay and he's kind of like he's, he he basically says something along the lines of like I, I hope he knows that, like, I couldn't have helped him. 
because of like the position that I was in. And Yang Chen just leaves kind of going like, like, you know, that just that kind of mixed response of like, I I'm glad you asked about your cousin, but also like, wow, you, you put the kind of rational aspect of your leadership position over basically saving a family member in the middle of the kind of platinum affair. Because again, remember, uh, Alkudan and Taigum were both basically captured in the middle of the platinum affair. And it was Yang Chen who got them out, not um, Oyalok. Now, this was something rumored as well, I think, from the first book that Akudan was related to royalty. So this is where we get the kind of actual direct confirmation of that, which is quite interesting. But it's just a, a, a nice little moment that like you kind of feel like th there is kind of Yi at his best, remembering a little bit of setup from the first book and just delivering on it in a kind of very short period of time, but it just being a nice moment. And um, but one of the other reasons Yang Chen is up in the north is that she immediately then goes to the spirit oasis in the north. So this is the uh, the the pond, of course, with Tui and La, and she meditates into the spirit world. So very early on in the book, like just like two three chapters in, she's already attempting to meditate into the spirit world to look look for Jetson again. Now obviously this is a little bit of a dangerous thing. Her trying to do this alone. And now what ends up happening here is very interesting. Like she she knows what she's after here, the kind of fog of lost souls. It's it's confirmed in this book, that's what it is. Um she targets that and she actually ends up meditating into the spirit world, uh, body and spirit, spirit and body. Like she goes in like physically. Um and it's one of those things where initially I was kind of like am I okay with that? Do I, do I like that that is a possibility? And, um, but then I remembered like, okay, look, it's the avatar. Yang Chen is known to be like particularly kind of spiritual. Um, it is one of the most spiritual places, uh, in the world with two all-powerful spirits there of course there is history with this specific place as being a place where this can happen now admittedly that is like sort of the incident of like say co dragging someone into the spirit world and we know that spirits seem to have that power but i think i'm okay with just the the specific circumstances allowing yang chen to also kind of pass over um physically i don't think this is something that like other you know spiritual kind of humans would necessarily be able to do but anyway she gets in there now the first time obviously the they're, they're going for here is that kind of bookmarking of this of like right at the start here is this kind of failure scene where she doesn't it doesn't work out when she encounters the fog it begins to kind of uh you know you know the the fog begins to take effect on her and the you know the we we know what this is about it, it kind of it makes you relive your um mistakes your failures and it really kind of like targets you mentally to break you because it's the spirit prison the idea seems to be here is if the spirit to judge you as having done something wrong as a human you are placed into this for eternity basically that is the idea of the fog of lost souls and so if you have any kind of lingering doubts over things it will target you and we know yang chen has a lot of that stuff in a way specifically about jetson and so she goes in she sees people tortured like tortured just by their own memories uh, and really struggles with it and so there's a real kind of panic here of like this is going wrong is yang chen about to be trapped in the spirit world body and soul is this the end of the avatar uh, in this incident and it's at this point we actually cut over to like this is where we cut chapter we introduce kavik a unirak and what's going on there and uh uh, they are end up or, or are in the north at this point and they quickly realize like oh what's going on with the avatar and they, they hear the report that like oh her, her lemurs are like kind of clawing at this kind of area we checked she she's if she was in there we assume she'd be meditating but she's just not in there and uh, kavik i think is the first one to figure it out is like something must have happened and i think a unirac then is just like oh well something's gone wrong I, I guess, you know, something spiritual, like she's meditating in the spirit world has happened. So they head there and they, when they arrive in the spirit oasis, uh, she has been kind of 
spat back out into the physical world, but the fog has come with her. So uh, what ends up happening is that uh, Ayurnarak tries to fight it, but of course it's just a fog. Um, you don't really know exactly how to fight it. Um, Kavik bends some of the spirit water from the spirit oasis, and uh, when he splashes that water over the fog, it kind of uh, f flees basically from the power of you know all powerful spirits effectively. Uh, I think he also douses uh, Yang Chen in it to sort of you know, heal her and kind of uh, get her kind of up and going again. Uh, she more or less gets across the idea that the reason that she wasn't just trapped and was kind of spat back out was that because she is the Avatar and her connections to the past lives are so open, the fog was almost like overloaded with the amount of material it had to kind of throw back in her face. And that's why she was kind of uh, spat back out. But uh, that is where we get the kind of reunion between um, Kavik and Yang Chen, him actually saving her in this in uh, incident um, with a Unirak there. And of course, very early on in the book, we do get the kind of Yang Chen uh, Kavik pairing once again, like I talked about previously. Um, it's just pretty open about like, yeah, I want him to spy on you for me, but I also think you need him as your companion. And she kind of reluctantly accepts this uh, situation. Now, like I said, we do come back to the Jets and stuff at the end of the book. So after Kavik has basically redeemed himself, uh, she decides that you are coming with me. You are going to be my kind of partner uh, to assist me because you always, as it was explained early on so in the first book, you know, you, you, you always want to meditate into the spirit world with someone else. Um, whether that be someone to come with you or someone just to protect your body. And in this case, Kavik is there to protect her body. He's not going in with her. So she does it this time. And obviously, like, there's been a lot of character development at this point. Um, she um, has... She, she's more, like, direct and focused on what's going on here. The idea of, like, her failures isn't as much on her mind here. But, you know, we, we still get this kind of emotional scene when we get in there so she's not immediately infected by the fog of lost souls this time she maintains her composure and is able to walk through and she finds Jetson in the fog and the idea the reveal here is effectively that Jetson is effectively unaffected by the fog because um she you know, the, the idea is effectively that she is kind of um, at peace with herself and her situation. And so the fog has no material to kind of throw back in her face. And she's effectively acting in the fog as someone there trying to help the other people being tortured by the fog. She seems to have this effect of being able to stop those kind of manic moments and actually manage to calm them down in a very similar way to the way she used to calm Yang Chen down when Yang Chen had her kind of uh, possessions by the uh, past uh, avatars. And obviously for Yang Chen, you, it, it's everything you expect from the scene. She's immediately emotional, apologizing to Jetson for, you know, she blames herself 100% for this. But um, Jetson is just like, no, it is fine. I'm I'm okay here. I did what I needed to do. I saved you. I did my job. That is all that matters. And then when it comes to like, you know, this is the role I'm playing in the spirit world. I, I assume you are playing a similar role in the physical world. And this is where Yang Chen has that kind of low moment of kind of saying that, um, no, it's not like I fail constantly. I'm, I'm not good enough. Like, you know, the, the, the dynamic that is kind of brought up across all of the kind of book is sort of the idea that, you know, like, I do a hundred things right, but people only remember the hundred and first thing that went wrong. Um, and I, I'm not kind of good enough to be the avatar. And Jetson is, is so interesting here because, of course, this is a character who is her sister. And, and we know they have that dynamic where I think in the first book it said something along the lines of like, um, Jetson would even either be the one who upset Yang Chen in the first place or the one who would kind of soothe her from someone else upsetting her. And Jetson is just kind of like, you know, there were times where I hated you. And Yang Chen's just like, what? Like, of all the times to say that, you say that to me, like, now when I'm going through all of this. But her point is that, but it never got in the way of like the, like the, the nuance of like, yeah, the, there were times where I was frustrated with you, but it doesn't counter the idea of all the other times when uh, I loved you and I did, and you were always like super, always super 
important to me as a sister. And that is the kind of key takeaway in the end is just that, you know, the smaller moments of kind of failure or maybe negativity fall short in the overall picture of like what the dynamic actually is. And it's just this kind of realization of like, how, how do I save you? Like, you don't need to save me. Like, I am fine. I, this is something I actually want to do here in the fog is to help these people because without me, like there isn't anyone else here. And this is a role that Jetson feels that she can play here. And so it's an interesting one. It is this kind of sacrifice from Jetson, but she seems to be at relative peace. So it's this interesting dynamic where it seems like the fog has the ability to prevent humans from becoming spirits like they otherwise usually would in the spirit world, like Iroh. Um, but she is not being turned into a manic wreck by the fog like other characters like Zhao were and um, so I was pretty happy with this resolution of that they they basically give Jetson the big final emotional kind of spirit world scene instead of a past avatar and I know straight away that a bunch of people are going to have an issue with that because they wanted Yang Chen to have a big conversation with Zito but to me the entire thematic emotional core of this these two books we're highlighting the idea that even though Yang Chen has this gift, the gift to her is not as useful as it seems to be on the outside to everyone else. I will just cite the Ayunarak conversation from the first book as the exact reason for why I think it would have been a bit silly to try and do this big like Yang Chen Zito scene as like some sort of a resolution. She's already spoken to Zito. It just it obviously wasn't a super important um, dynamic that uh, they, they had before. She's spoken to dozens upon dozens of avatars. As far as we're aware, she knows the gist of the entire story legacy of all avatars. Um, that's how you know much she has connected to the past lives. But does it help her on a day-to-day -day basis deal with a lot of these issues? And, you know, to a certain degree, you would say, like, yes, in bro in a broad sense, just to have that vast wealth of knowledge. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it doesn't help her because those avatars can't give her advice on the specific situations that she's dealing with right now. As was pointed out in the first book, you can never force a past avatar to understand what a Shang merchant is. So they can never give you specific advice about how they would handle a conflict like this. And that's always been the, the frustration for Yang Chen is that she already has all of the pearls of wisdom. She would love to have specific advice, but she doesn't have that. But instead, again, the whole dynamic of these books is to highlight the companions as being a super important thing. And again, Kavik returning into her life is something that is extraordinarily helpful to her um, in all of this. Um, and then after this, so she leaves the spirit world. She's happy to leave Jetson there knowing that Jetson is, is all right. And I guess the idea is that Yang Chen can visit her if, if required and stuff like that. So that all works out well. But again, when she returns, the fog is back in the spirit oasis. And this time it is infecting um, Kavik. And what it is making Kavik relive, and it's the final proof, uh, truth, um, like y Yang Chen, like throughout the books, like, this is the thing she came to the conclusion about with Kavik in the first book, is that she can't tell for sure if he is lying or telling the truth. He's one of the only people that she's ever encountered who just, she can't read in that way. And so she's always unsure about like, is he being really truthful and earnest here? Or is he manipulating me by doing the thing that he feels would make me feel the best about him? And so in this case, the spirit drawing out the thing that he is most ashamed of effectively, and that is the lie, the betrayal from the first book. Him like kind of almost being held up, possessed by the fog of lost souls, saying stuff about, you know, the fake information about the sunbeam ship and stuff like that. And it's this proof as she saved Kavik, like he did to her at the start of the book with the spirit water. And um, it is this kind of proof of like, there is the most concrete thing. She's basically already forgiven him at this point, but this, it puts it over the edge. Um, she knows he was extraordinarily remorseful about this situation. And then pretty much like there in the spirit oasis, this is where 
we we form reform these two together as avatar and avatar companion um she asks like are you continuing with the white lotus he says like no i don't want to uh, i think i'll settle down as just being like an assistant to a healer i i see i i think i'm good at that and that's what i want to do and she's just like no don't do that i need you I need you to be there by my side, helping me through everything that I'm about to do. Like, basically, you are an Avatar companion. What do you say? And then the book ends with the idea of he says, you know, I'll sleep on it. It's like a bit of a joke of like, of course, he's going to accept. But it's the final bit of like ribbing between the two in the book. But overall, the two are back, you know, t together um, at last. And um, so... Um, that's fantastic and again that was that's been kind of one of the main themes from this book is avatar and their companion like we started off with yan chen being possessed by avatar goon talking about uh, the companion masosa which comes up again in this book in an interesting way and now we end with her actually having her own companion um and yeah the while, while i'm at this point i suppose like we'll, we'll get to the stuff in the middle of the book of course as we go through but the scene with uh yang chen being so exhausted uh and being possessed by uh, by goon happens relatively early right after she kind of reunites with kavik like they just kind of like they they go about their business together uh and then he's kind of just kind of standing watch effectively um as she goes to sleep and it just happens and a Unirak has told him about this like so he has been briefed on what to expect because he's ne otherwise he's never seen this before but he knows basically what's happening here and so he's kind of like wait what avatar yang chen is that you and it's just her speaking as avatar goon and avatar goon is expressing that to to misosa that like i think i'm done i think i've given up on humanity like it's just too much at this point that the idea like i think he's the one who specifically who says like i could do a hundred things right but they'll only remember that 101st time when something goes wrong and um, like that there's there's no i don't think there's any hope for them they always seem to just make the wrong the selfish choice no matter how much i guide them in the right direction why should i care like Miss Osa, tell me why i should care and Kavik is forced because like they, they created this dynamic where what eases the burden on Yang Chen as she's possessed is someone talking to the past avatar as if they are the companion. So it's Kav Kavik having to answer as if he was kind of Misosa and answer the question. And he just kind of says, you know, the idea of like, I, I understand that um, in many ways. I agree that like we are probably not worth having such a, an amazing protector as the avatar, but you have to trust just as a fundamental thing trust that this is the right thing to do and gun kind of laughs at it and it's just like is that it like blind faith that's it and it kind of is the ultimate answer to it um ultimately and i just kind of find it um so interesting ultimately and and again it relates of course to what we we learned about in that initial scene which is that like misosa died uh, during an incident where Gun like protected a town from a kind of tsunami or tidal wave coming in uh, but she died in the flooding and it was him of course protecting humanity there so it's kind of like this kind of in interesting idea of just that this is we, we are roughly told about the idea that like Gun didn't give up on humanity but he came so close and, I, and it's, it's a moment in the book where I think Kavik knows Yang Chen well enough to be like, I wouldn't blame her if she began to feel the same way based on stuff I've seen and stuff that she has seen like directly as well. Um, so that's all, uh, I think, very strong. Some of that's, that, that character work in, in scenes like that is, in my mind, like really, really strong. Um, while we're still talking about, I suppose, characters here, uh, Kavik's other plot, I suppose, would just be, uh, what do they do with Kalyan in the book, his brother? So um, one thing they establish is that the assassin, and we'll get to what exactly happens during the assassination, the freeing of unanimity, but the assassin turns out to be Kal Kalyan. He is the one who, uh, working for Chai C, ends up uh, freeing unanimity um, and uh, he kills Hansha as well that that is the person who gets assassinated so kavik realizes this because he 
gets to basically Hansha just after he's been assassinated. He doesn't see his brother, but he can see that there is like a melting, like icicle kind of spear on the ground. That this was the weapon that was used, and he can sort of tell that this is the handiwork of my brother. And this is kind of what happens as we go through the book. And Kalyan, ultimately, like I said in the, the video yesterday, they ultimately lean in the idea that he does still care about his family. So all the stuff from the first book about how he left, but he left the family like a new house, was him showing that he cared, but still trying to, you know, achieve his ambitions as a person. Still kind of, you know, falling to being this person who wants to be like an errand runner and wanting to um, have these high up positions, kind of basically becoming a criminal, but still caring about his family. He still cares about Kavik deep down, which is why he did honestly protect Kavik by like not having Chaisi in any way come into contact or know anything about Kavik. And that continues into this book. You see that the ultimate weakness for Kalyan, who otherwise is like an incredible assassin, um, if, he, if he doesn't want you to find him, you won't find him. That sort of character. The weakness, the one character who can draw him out is Kavik. In a way, Kavik putting himself in danger is what will draw Kalyan out. And this is kind of how they end up, you know, in a way resolving stuff at the end. This is the, before we get to the more emotional kind of thing where Yang Chen sees uh, directly Kavik's uh, greatest uh, mistake by the fog of lost souls. The thing that really kind of proves to her and, and kind of like brings forgiveness is he, he kind of makes a sacrifice in a way for like one of the first times. Like, because they highlight in the book that, um, Yang Chen lost a lot because his um, his betrayal led to her having to deal with all this stuff about unanimity. It led to Taigum and Akudan having to leave their homes because they'd be at danger in Jandari um, and so on. E even Jujinta, to a certain extent, can't really go back to Jandari because of what happened as well. Um, so they've lost everything, but in a way, Kavik hasn't in all of this. Like, he still has his brother, his parents are still alive, um, he now worked with the Order of the White Lotus and seems to be basically back in Team Avatar. Um, has he actually lost anything in this? And so the, the kind of end plan of the book is that he's like, I will use the, my brother's care for me against him to basically allow us to either they, like it's a it's a two-stage plan where he's like if it goes this way then just quite simply um i can manipulate him turn him to our side and that will win the day if not i am willing to go through some pain for this and that is basically this plan that okay if this one doesn't work where we can't, if we can't turn um, Kalyan to our side by basically revealing that we will out you to Chaisi as like a traitor because of like what happened in the first book. Um, and obviously the, we'll get to that. Reveals come out that mean that that plan isn't going to work. So they have to resort to the secondary plan, which is um, Yang Chen won't be involved in this plan, but uh, Taigo, Makudan and Jujinta will be. In the middle of a incident that happens, J Jujinta will apparently stab Kavik quite brutally, and then Kalyan will look for somewhere to heal his brother, and who will be waiting for him there? But Taigum and Akudan, and this is what happens. This all plays out perfectly, um, but it's only revealed later that it's a plan and they act perfectly the whole time through just like they, they managed to capture um Kalyan because he's distracted by his brother but also one of the kind of interesting kind of reveals about Taigum and Akudan is that they actually reveal Akudan is a waterbender he just hides it perfectly so one of the interesting things said in the first book was like I think Tail says it uh, or something like that that he can he notices subtle little details with benders that water benders will glance towards sources of water in every room that they're in earth benders will do the same that sort of thing they're they are always to some extent drawn to their elements but kavik has never noticed akudan do this so it's a surprise to even um uh kavik that akudan is a water bender but they managed to capture it's a, it's a great tag team move between um the kind of husband pairing here akudan and uh, taigum as they capture um uh, kalyan and effectively they torture 
Kavik in front of him. The stab wound, they're like, oh yeah, we're, we're, this looks real bad. How about we not heal this? And how about we make it worse unless you tell us what's going on? And this ends up being key because he he breaks. Like th this is what actually breaks Kalyan. His, his care for his family is super important and he gives the information required, which is ultimately key in terms of how Yang Chen um, can turn the tables on Chai Si on her side of the story and kind of uh, bring things to a conclusion. Um, the the other reveal like that I kind of skipped past was that the reason the other plan wouldn't work is because he Kalyon basically reveals that oh yeah she she's just going to forgive me for everything I've already told her because she's more lenient on me because I'm the father of her child and it's it's sort of in a way the expected reveal I think in terms of the expectations it was just like well it either probably has to be him she's trying to somehow make her child a combustion bender or it's just someone random and. They, they went for what was the obvious ploy, which was that Hansha in the end is just this person who had ambitions, but just wasn't good enough. And the reality of the situation is that um, ultimately Kalyan found a, a greater loyalty to his second boss than his first boss. And so was ultimately working for her uh, loyally the, the whole time through. Um, so that's very interesting. Now, they don't particularly explore like the relationship between Kalyan and Chaisi about how that exactly happened um, how much she particularly cares about him or not um, I get the impression it's like you know the fact that she was willing to forgive him she cares about him to a certain extent like she wants her having her own family is important, but I, I do feel the child is the thing she's more focused on than necessarily the father in, in the situation here. So, because I, I think there's that doubt over the whole thing with Kalyan of just like, he kind of knows in a way the whole time through the way she is. If something goes really wrong, there probably is a situation where she will choose to kind of dispose of me over, you know, um, letting me away with something. Um, so it's a very kind of interesting moment where Kavik is just like apparently dying on the uh, on the table and he's just like, okay, stop this, stop this. It's, there's no need to push any further because he doesn't want to put his brother through this like mental torture despite everything that's happened. He's not willing, he doesn't want to like destroy his brother. He still wants his brother to survive. Now, th th there's nuances to this as well because obviously it, the, the details I'll get into about like Project Unanimity and what they've done to, to make them... Um, is brutal kind of like kind of in a way beyond belief so can he ever forgive him for that but it's also a key part at the end where like it is Kavik being like you know okay look I don't want my brother to die I'm loyal to him in that way but I am at my core more loyal to you Yang Chen the avatar and <laughs> than anyone else and, and in this mission he's also like this is where he more or less is just sort of like I'm not even really into the Order of the White Lotus. Like, I will I will fully support you. They're not involved in the mission anymore. That's it. So, uh, I suppose final points on uh, Kalyan is just that he survives the book. He is effectively allowed to get away. I, it, It's a little bit vague. I, I definitely think I need to reread some of the exact specifics here. But I'm pretty sure what ends up happening at the end of the book is that the the way things wrap up it puts Chaisi in such a bad position when it comes to like Feishan basically trying to hunt her down that they effectively allow that kind of family unit uh Chaisi, Kalyan and their son to just you know get away because they're gonna have to just be constantly on the run trying to get away from Earth King Feishan that they won't ever be able to plot anything more. That they should have enough resources to stay, to stay safe from Feishan, but they won't have the time to be more of a menace than that. And it's the idea of like, they don't want to destroy a family here. You know, Kavik still doesn't want, doesn't want his brother to die. He wants his nephew, his, Kavik's nephew, uh, to, to have a life. Um, and they're not just going to kill Chai Si. And this is kind of, to some extent, like the punishment of this, of just having to basically kind of live on the run effectively. I, I wish they'd covered a little bit more about the, 
like exact nature of kind of what's actually going to happen there but it's a it's an it's a nice enough ending in the sense that like yes a lot of the point that they're making in this book is that our hero characters are not going to resort to the same methods that the villains are to make all this stuff happen so getting into i suppose the sort of crimes of chaisi and unanimity how did they do that in this book so and the inciting incident like i said is this assassination slash uh, breakout at the northern air temple so um basically uh, kalyan leads this uh, we don't really get to see the action it just sort of happens and it's yang chen dealing with the crisis over here kavik dealing with it over here um but basically kalyan kills hansha uh, he seems to b have beforehand set up like a kind of net underneath uh, thapa's window so that thapa can escape um, and this is kind of what happens first. And then the one of the bigger twists in the first part of the book that ends up happening is that Thapa immediately betrays his uh, fellow unanimity members and he uh, apparently kills the other two combustion benders. Now there's a there's a big big plot point that gets like twist heavily twisted upon uh, by the end of the book, which is that Zhao Yun is is killed. Thapa kills Zhao Yun. Um, but the book leads you to believe that Ying Su is killed as well. This is where Yang Chen, once she finally deals with the the kind of, uh, there's a rock slide that happens like because of the explosions going off. Uh, once she deals with that, she heads for where Ying Su is because she thinks she will have the best time, like just handling, dealing with her because of the whole, I showed mercy to you before when you were shot with the arrow. I basically saved your life um, and there's a bit more of a rapport there between the two and that is exactly the case ying su is completely aware of what is happening here she's um uh, made sure to in a way sort of protect the air nomad guards around her um and is trying to keep everyone quiet to avoid getting uh, hit by thapa they, they describe it as sort of like thapa is kind of like a long way away and can just kind of barely tell where they are um, but so they have to stay quiet and out of his range, of course. And so we actually get some conversation between um, Yang Chen and a unanimity member here. Um, and there's some fascinating stuff that happens here. The main thing for the plot that happens is that this is where Yang Chen learns that um, the plan for unanimity, if they weren't going, if if they weren't taken by Hansha um, to deal with whatever happened to Bin Er, was for this big attack on Taku when the big Taku conference was going to happen where all the world leaders and all of the Zongdus would meet up to deal with any changes that have happened to the Shang system in the meantime uh, and so this was obviously Chai Si's plan for unanimity was to uh, effectively attempt to wipe out the other world leaders and um, force a situation where this would uh, basically uh, in a way, force the surviving like Zongdus, especially her, into a position where they would be allowed to keep the positions longer to stabilize the world effectively, um, and that was kind of her plan overall. Was a um, a specific strike by like the full three members of unanimity against all of the world leaders uh, as a. The, the, as a, a more effective way to use it like in a way the exact opposite approach of Honsha who just decided ooh powerful firebenders immediately start firing we'll hold up in this position and play defense whereas she was more like no I will play one moment of offense and win the day with just like a couple of combustion blasts that was her approach in all of this that like if we just have like boom one blast kills all the world leaders that's a shocking stunning moment in history and um, and so that's what was avoided but that meeting is still coming up and obviously the idea is that pl that plan must still be on the table this is why there's this breakout attempt actually happening here she still needs the unanimity members to make this happen and um, so so that that's what's uh, going on there what ends up happening is that um they're kind of pinned down and they're like if anyone like makes a move like we're just going to get blasted what are we going to do and ying su is kind of forcing yang chen to be like well you took us out before just do it again and yang chen can't really kind of explain why she can't because of course that relied on you guys were in rooms i sucked the air out of the room and she's not going to explain that that is what she did but because they're out in the open here it won't have the same effect 
And so this is where one of the other fellow air nomads comes in. He's kind of willing to make the sacrifice on his glider. He flies in to distract Thapa. And Yang Chen, it seems like, makes the decision to save her brother over uh, like Ying Su, uh, um, basically. And that she manages to, you, we basically cut to her arriving in the hospital with a badly injured air nomad. And then shortly afterwards, the bodies of uh, Zhao Yun and Ying Su are carted in with the idea seemingly being that Yang Chen jumping up to save her brother alerted uh, Thapa to the fact that, oh, there's someone below. And that's how uh, Ying Su got taken out. But much, much later on in the book, basically, when we get to the incident in Taku and we are getting the, the showdown, effectively, between Yang Chen and Thapa properly, this is where we actually just suddenly are like flashback. Wait, how is she going to deal with Thapa here? She's like wide open like in the middle of the air how is she going to deal with thapa just already having a blast prepared to go and then you're like wait they never actually told us what happened with the thapa blast in that incident we cut past it so we don't actually know what happened and this is where they they come out with a pretty clever reveal which is that no um she like succeeded she was able to save her brother but she was also able to save ying su but she came up with a plan which was that well if he's trying to eliminate the other unanimity members let's make it look like that you act dead i'll um basically <laughs> um spirit you away somewhere hide you and it, for basically like two-thirds of the book yang chen has this secret information that she actually has Ying Su uh, like hidden away somewhere. That she she is effectively in control of a unanimity member, um, who is like basically completely on her side at this point. And so one of the things that we get from this is that you know basically okay we're, we're on better terms with each other. Um, I'm going to give you a chance at a better life. Um, you you can choose a couple of things to do here, but um, you know like I can. Uh, find you some place to live we'll, we'll we'll do our best to hide you because no one technically knows this specific person is a combustion bender so if you just hide your abilities no one should know it's you you can live your life but first there's one thing i want from you and that is i want you to blow me up and this is where we get the idea that yang chen actually did some training with ying su to counter combustion blasts in a way that didn't require her to use her um, soaking the air out of her room technique. And this is where she developed uh, this technique, which she did on the fly to avoid everyone dying in the assassination incident, uh, which she then gets revealed to be a master of in the incident, the, the fight with Thapa, which is, it's related to the soaking air out of the room technique, but it's basically this kind of um, voiding an area of air technique. So it's basically... A, a more focused version of the kind of vacuum technique, but just on a very specific spot. In this case, for combustion bending, targeting the point at which the combustion blast, blast explodes. Because we know the way it operates is that like it kind of like goes pop, pop, pop. But then there's a specific point at which the actual explosion happens and it goes off from that point. And she has trained herself to target void the area where the final blast is about to take place and before the explosion actually goes off just void it out and they, they use the word void a lot you know uh, and there's definitely some allusions to that whole thing it's like uh, become the void type stuff and um, and it works this is how she saved herself initially and this is how the the duel with thapa goes so he's hidden underneath basically the area where all the world leaders are going to be um, but the signal has been obviously delivered early in this case. I'll get to the specifics about that in a minute. Um, and so he, she's just up in the air having just done this. And he delivers a blast and she's just like, whoosh, and, and creates this kind of void and just, it's like pop up, nothing. And so he's stunned at this. Like, how did this happen? Like, where, where's my blast gone? And so he decides, I'm going to do a rapid fire attack, uh, which Yang Chen isn't aware he can do, but she's prepared ahead of time. She actually had uh, Ying Su 
basically forcibly try to do combustion blast as quick as possible. So she's actually prepared to do this void technique as soon as possible. So the second attack, not as powerful, comes in. She voids it again. And he, at this point, like, he doesn't really have any moves left, so he just has to go for another blast. But he is in no way prepared. Like, there's no breaths or anything like that, because he knows if he tries to even do, like, 5-10 breaths, Yang Chen as the Avatar is just going to, like, obliterate him. And so he tries to do a third blast, like, in seconds, and he basically combustion mans himself. Um, they, they describe it as, like, he tries to do the, you know, the the, the chest caves in, but, like, it he caves in, but, like, he stumbles to the side, um, and the pops start to happen, like, in or around over the top of him. And this is where Yang Chen is just, like, I'm sorry. And just like drills the area where he is like into the ground. Like she sends him to the depths with this like um, crazy like earth attack that is just to protect everyone from like basically like a ex bunch of explosions going off. And so she just has it go off underground. So Thoppa dies in a sort of Combustion Man-esque way, but it's almost even more kind of like brutal in a way but yeah it's it's definitely that sort of thing where like yang chen basically kills thoppa in this uh, incident like you can explain it away with some technicalities but she kind of is just like yeah this is this is effectively what i've done here it's what i've needed to do um it's what i had to do uh, and so that is how she deals with uh, the threats. That's how unanimity kind of comes to a conclusion, which is uh, one of them is killed uh, early on in the book by Thapa. Thapa dies in um, this duel with Yang Chen because she's fully prepared for like the uh, the full plan that Shai Si had going on. And Ying Su survives and is working for Yang Chen. And this continues into the end of the book. Like the book ends and like Feishan knows that the combustion bender works for her and it's it's this really interesting twist on the whole idea of like she's been trying to avoid the combustion benders getting into the hands of other people but she she only now is considering like wait what if the combustion bender worked for me i'm not corrupted i won't be corrupted i won't use it for kind of ill gains but i can make good happen by kind of forcing the hands of the world leaders a little bit myself and it's i think it's just a nice twist on on the kind of threat of of combustion manning is for it, it to end up in yang chen's control and her to actually have the the true loyalty of ying su going forward it also uh, for i suppose the history of combustion bending uh, allows us to have this situation where okay there's at least a surviving combustion bender in this era establishing how at least aspects of this technique continue on after the the failure of chaisi's scheme the uh, destruction of the compound where uh, combustion benders were trained which i will get into uh, in just a moment so some very very cool stuff at the end of the book just that like oh yeah because they, they, they Kav, when she tells Kavik about like Ying Su's alive he's kind of like is she joining up and Yang Chen's just kind of like yeah I'm not sure like maybe so they almost allude to the idea that like Ying Su could be like a Yang Chen team avatar member um I'm not sure it's going to be like exactly like that but I'm guessing Ying Su will just be this like occasional, um, you know, uh, star kind of, uh, you know, person that she can go to whenever she needs uh, something really kind of notable done. Um, and it's just a, a, a nice kind of a reveal on the whole thing. Um, Chaisi, Let, let's get into Chaisi and then I'll do the, uh, the, the, the origins of the, the details of uh, unanimity and, and combustion banding. So, I would say Chaisi is maybe one of the more kind of frustrating parts of the book where the first chapter definitely leads you to believe that, oh, they're going in depth. They're, 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 there's going to be multiple Chaisi chapters. It's going to be great. But there's not really. There's that first chapter. You get one chapter when like Thapa is kind of like returned to her. Um, which is quite interesting because like there's there's a reveal that happens like quite early on, which is that when he's interacting with um, Shai Si, he immediately tries to do to her 
what he did to Honsha, which is, oh, the reason, basically, the reason I killed the others is because I'm now the only uh, useful combustion mender left. Um, pay me 30 times what I'm worth, or I might go and see the Earth King and see if he wants my services, that sort of thing. And um, he's clever in that sense of like realizing that he's useful to world leaders, people across the world. He can get whatever money he wants. <laughs> um, but in this case, he has miscalculated and he's kind of like, you know, he, he was able to fluster Hansha by demanding so much money, but it doesn't work on Chaisi. So he's about to walk out the door and she's just like, um, basically, she, the Earth King has invited you to uh, Lake Laogai's um, Thapa. She uses different words. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably Shoken um, text uh, here is what, based on the, the way it kind of sounds. So she says something, he kind of goes blank and gives a kind of a zombie-like kind of response to it. And it's just like, oh, brainwashing's involved here as well. And she even mentions that like, yeah, Thapa is the most like scheming of the three uh, unanimity members, but... He also was the most kind of uh, easy to brainwash. So probably the most easy to control. And she even says that like, you know, she tests the control of the brainwashing and it's like, you know, stab yourself in the thigh. And there's a bit of a laugh. It's like, oh, has it worked? And then he's like, oh, sorry about that. Um, how many times? And it's, that's where the, the chapter ends with the idea that like, oh, Chaisi has full control over Thapa. And they note this as like they go into like where Thapa's revealed during the kind of fight with Yang Chen at the end of the book. She notes that like he's not talking like the way he usually would. The fact that he's so just um laser focused on attacking, um if it almost feels like he's been brainwashed, but she's not fully like aware of the the exact kind of like takeaway from that. And um, so, so that that's a pretty cool thing. But what 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 ends up being Chai C's kind of like defeat is that like effectively her care for her quote unquote family because she was lenient to Kalyan. Kalyan leaks the information of the call for Thapa to attack is uh, three rings of the th three beats of the gong in Taku, and that will signal uh, Thapa to attack. And so because Yang Chen now knows that information, she can actually control the situation in um, in Taku with Chai Si. Whereas before, Chai Si had the advantage because she had a unknown combustion bender. Like, Thapa has been hidden since his escape at the start of the book. They have no clue where specifically he is. Um, and of course... She's waiting for the time when she can basically uh, attack and ambush the world leaders. Now, there's a little bit of a complexity to this where, like, she doesn't necessarily want to do this. And, and, and I think the plan is effectively, like, Yang Chen, come in here and when the meeting happens, support me on what I'm about to suggest, which is Zhang Du should have unlimited term. Let Agree with this and then basically nothing needs to happen. But Yang Chen realizes that this is basically Chai Si using the fact that she has a combustion bender to force the avatar to do whatever she wants. That this will be the first of many times that Chai Si attempts to use this to her advantage. And so this is why Yang Chen has to gain the advantage here. And she does exactly that. And so once she gets the information about the three um, bells, what she does is Chai Si's outside she basically creates like an earth kind of pillar around them effectively. Uh, but they're definitely in the blast zone of like where Thapa would attack. And she signals the three bells with the, them trapped basically in the building together. And it's this basically who will blink first moment. And Chaisi tries as hard as she can to get out of this situation being like, Think about what this would do to you. You're going to die if we get hit by this blast as well. Um, look, what what will the, the nations lose? What will everyone lose if you die? And she's just like, what are you talking about? Like, I can't ever truly die. I'm the Avatar. Like, I'll, I'll come back. It'll just take a little bit of time. But And then yeah, Yang Chen turns the tables. But you, you have a lot to lose because you care about legacy. And, and this is what's so interesting. The way she turns the tables so perfectly on Chai Si is like, well, actually, in a way, no, 
some a lot of your stuff will be looked after like um your money your loyal subjects will kind of uh, look after it distribute it where it needs to go uh, the people that you pay and treat so well i'm sure will look after your son with great care and it's like the second yang chen says that chai is like i give up like whatever you need i i absolutely give up and it's just that moment of like chai C realizing that like there it is double like my son is at risk my legacy is at risk and I don't trust the people that I pay because I kind of know I don't treat them well enough to have the loyalty where they would truly care that much about my child if I died. And and I, I, I like that as the twist of like, this is the character who, as we know, like the, her legacy is the, the thing above all else that she wants. And now that is being put at risk um, immediately. It's 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 fascinating and and yang chen obviously holds it like until like you know until she gets chai si in exactly the position that she wants and that is like to get her to say like help me avatar yang chen and then she jumps out and initiates the the attack and does the whole voiding thing and so on but after this it is just sort of established that yeah they basically let chai si go they uh pretty much hand over kalyan hand over her child to her and are like go I'm sure Faishan's going to chase you. Do what you need to do. Because that it, that effectively is her dealt with. She doesn't have the time to scheme. She just is going to be focused on protecting her child. And I, I'm guessing the idea would be that they would... Yang Chen and other people would probably step in. If maybe they did actually ever get caught. To avoid them being actually taken out by the Earth King. But the situation where they haven't caught her yet. Uh, helps them ultimately. Now... Let's get to the uh, kind of big reveal that I think a lot of people were waiting for in this book. And that is, what do they actually reveal about the origins of unanimity? And how do they kind of get around to it? And then I, I alluded to the idea that um, there's a f key fundamental thing missing, in my mind, from the uh, explanation. So, what they what they eventually get to here is there's a, there's a multi-layer reveal here. Uh, the end result is that... Just Yang Chen having Ying Su on her side tells her exactly where the island is, where they do the training. But Yang Chen realizes that to play this perfectly so that no one has any idea that you're alive, I have to actually take my team on a mission to discover information that would allow us to logically figure out where the island is. And so this is the whole reason, the whole, like, um kind of a sparrow bone scene with um zongdu iwashi of taku happens this is the entire reason that whole thing happens and that they 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 have taigo and akudan infiltrate that ship while uh kavik and yang chen do the whole mission uh playing the sparrow bones game is literally just so that they get his reports which will eventually tell them about like oh he's sending stuff to these spots on the map why would he be doing that <laughs> it has to be uh him doing stuff for Chai C. Uh, and so they, that's how they kind of publicly it is decided that they go to this specific area to search for an island and it's how they find uh, unanimity. But the reality of it is that Ying Su just told Yang Chen where it was because uh, her history uh, is that she actually has what, what did she see? Did she say like orienteering experience? So she knows how to direct people to a, a place that she's not even super familiar with. So that's all, that, that's all cool. So this is where the, the team, uh, who is it? It's, it's Yang Chen, uh, Kavik, and Jujinta go to this island. Now, it ends up getting revealed to basically be this is the island where Chai Si comes from. No one knows what it is. She's always ta ta talked about it as a mystery. No one's ever really been there. So it makes sense. It's a kind of mystery kind of uh, fire island somewhere in between the two nations. Now... It does seem to be more or less said to us at some point in the book that it's uh, part of the Natsuo Island uh, kind of chain of islands. Uh, so I think the impression is that this probably is just a very tiny island that probably almost is so small it barely appears on the map near Natsuo Island, which we know about from legends as a disputed area in the Roku era between Earth and Fire Nation. Um, so it makes sense. It, it completely fits in with that. But what happens is they get to this island and it is basically abandoned. 
there's they they initially they don't find any people whatsoever on this island but they're aware something has gone on they find basically a barracks uh w with enough space for like a hundred people there's a huge focus on like the training room and a lot of medical supplies for basically fighters so clearly training is happening here with benders and non-benders what's going on here um they they walk out and then they come across this um this kind of small kind of mountain what way is it exactly described it's just kind of this small tunnel kind of like built into a, a hill or a cliffside and it's this tiny little door and they're like why is it so small obviously they don't want people to get out and they want to avoid like as much you know light and sound getting in as possible so they crawl in and it's it's basically this quote unquote torture room now i find that like this is one of the points where i think i mentioned in the review that there's a few points where i was just uh, confused by the description so I, i'm actually going to read out a little bit about this and and i want you guys in the comments to let me know what you think this is like what is your initial impression of this description what this room is meant to be because i racked my brain for like ages just thinking about like what am i meant to take away from this i think i know what they're going for but uh i'll read it out first so so they go into the room they establish there is a large um pile of scrap metal sitting in the center of the room after they light the fire to reveal what's in there um, and then it says iron hoops in assorted sizes some of the rings were only as big as a pumpkin and others were so large they'd been broken down into quarters to fit through the tunnel while they'd been tossed into the heap without care like a collection of cheap bangles Kavik noticed the pieces could have been arranged in a continuous line from largest to smallest without duplicates what do you make of this he asked the others maybe a cooper had been searching for an ideal barrel size to trial and error i don't know yang chen said but there's something underneath she was right buried underneath the metal was a cloth covered object probably a chair judging by the shape yang chen began to pull the rings off and throw them into the corner pausing only to examine her hands with distaste they're greasy kavik helped her the iron was indeed slippery with animal fat as if the pieces had to slide against a moving component uh once the last ring had been pushed aside he wiped his hands on a corner of the cloth before yanking it away he needed a moment to fully comprehend the object he just unveiled. Oh no, Kavik murmured. No, no, no. It was indeed a chair, but the feet were bolted to the floor. The legs, armrest, and back had, a leather, had leather restraints to fit around the body of the occupant. The seat had been stained dark by foulness. The ends of the arms were grooved and splintered where fingernails had gouged into the wood. And then after this, Kavik is about to get sick. And pretty much Jujinta as well. So Yang Chen is like, you two get out. Don't don't wreck this place. She then follows them out. And as they're kind of like dealing with the, the horror of what they've just discovered, Yang Chen makes the decision to just like earthbend this place into oblivion. Like she destroys this place. And I'm just kind of like, wait, wait, wait. Why am I getting this reaction from the characters without them saying to each other, what it is they're reacting about because what do they mean by that because okay chair bolted to the floor chair has restraints okay that's not great just being trapped in a dark room not great already i guess a form of torture to a degree um but what is the actual torture what, what, what is so evil about this what are these uh, iron hoops that they talk about why are they greasy why are they in multiple sizes like is there some form of torture device that i'm meant to know about that like i don't actually know about i'm so incredibly confused and i was for ages until i reread the book and when i got to the scene with thapa and um chai si again i'm like oh it, is that what this is meant to be that this is meant to be the area where they did the brainwashing that the hoops make the rails where the Dai Li would um spin the the kind of light around on is that why it's so big that like they were like testing it out and they needed like multiple sizes to see like how how big of a hoop they actually needed um is it is it something like that 
that is the only thing that I can think of. I even went back to the scene in um, uh, City of Walls and Secrets. And yes, there's certainly some iron hoops and they're quite big, but I'm guessing the Dial E have it more kind of down as an art form, the way to do it. This might be a little bit more like um, just discovering the technique because otherwise I'm kind of like, Wait, wh why do they react like this? Like, wh what is the, the takeaway? Is there some torture that involves iron hoops that I'm not uh, aware of or, or what? But then that brings up a question in itself, which is like, how does Kavik and Jujinta and Yang Chen know that this device is used for brainwashing if it's so apparently like new or different? Do they, do they know for sure that that's what it is and that's why they consider it evil? Um, it's... It's just a bit of a weird one uh, where, like, I don't even know if that's what the interpretation of this is meant to be. Because as we go through, we basically find out that, okay, there are actually other people on the island. So they, they encountered these two kids, um, uh, Raite and uh, Hsen. It's like H-S-I-E-N. So it's a girl and a boy, uh, pretty young. Um, the boy is a firebender. The girl is a non-bender. Now, after an initial incident where, like, you know, Kavik gets chi-blocked by the girl, obviously revealing her to be a chi-blocker, um, they effectively reveal how people came to this island, which is that they went to the kind of poorer islands around the Natsuo Island area and uh, had people kind of, like, sign up for this effectively i think kalyan later mentions that like oh, they were paid for their services you know they chose to do this but of course what actually happens to the people is pretty crazy um they sort of imply from what happens a little uh, in a second uh, that all of these people because they're from the in between earth and fire islands are either earthbenders firebenders or non-benders and so they mentioned that uh, they were all split up into groups so the non-benders were split up to do basically full-on hand-to-hand combat training and chain and train in chi blocking and um, the one thing they say about the earthbenders it's the only mention in that the whole book about the earthbenders the few earthbenders present had been marched deeper into the volcanic interior of the island for some unknown purpose they never returned now my takeaway from that is that well based on that the fact that the firebenders obviously go through some sort of combustion mending training and you're training probably the rarest and most unique non-bending uh martial art are you were were they trying to form the earthbenders and awaken lava bending in them by like having them encounter lava magma putting them at risk and hoping that that happened i'm guessing it ended in failure they do mention they only had a few earthbenders so i'm guessing there maybe just wasn't as many of them they didn't research this one as much but that is certainly the implication that i get from this is that that is the takeaway from it is that they they had the the earthbenders uh i'm assuming either try and go for lava bending or obviously metal bending doesn't get discovered yet so it can't be that so it probably has to be something about lava bending um so um that that's kind of interesting they do also mention there's another group that was uh, selected to uh, assigned to practice herbalism um, and I'm guessing that is like for like assassins and uh, people to be to, to poison. They, they come to the conclusion that, of course, effectively, this whole facility was designed by Chaisi and I guess Dushim and so on to create basically weapons for Chaisi. So she had like a uh, an amazing kind of elite force of benders and non-benders there to kind of protect her because again she wanted her legacy to be on John Dury and she was I'm guessing going to fill that up with her own army of specialized benders um now uh we we get the idea of like Jujinta begins to very much connect to the story of these two kids and this is the one thing that we really learn in this book about Jujinta's backstory which is basically just that he compares what he went through on his own island with the Yuyan to what these kids went through as part of you know the unanimity project effectively um which is a lot of competition uh pitting kids against each other you know uh, everyone fighting to avoid being in the lowest spot and be effectively eliminated 
uh, and he that is how he forged his skills. So they seem to basically imply that that's kind of how the Yu Yans have their skills, is that it's this incredibly strict, dangerous, uh, brutal training regiment. That is how they, you know, sharpen their skills with archery, throwing knives and stuff like that to such an insane degree to where they are effectively perfect. Um, that's the idea that they're going for there. They they don't go into any further detail on what exactly happened or what happened with his brother. Kavik does uh, make a jab at Jujinta about his brother, but that is the only real mention of it. There is even a scene like just before this chapter where Yang Chen and like um, Kavik are kind of like, "Hey, Jujinta, like open up to us, please." Like you know, it helps to talk about it. And he kind of explains like, no, um, it's different for me than it is for you guys. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. And so it is only through kind of comparing his past situation to this that we really learn anything about what happened. But then they turn their attention to the boys, so Raite, and they're like, okay, what about you? What, what training did you go through? And they're asking him like a bunch of questions about like, wait, tell us, this is the most important question. Are there other unanimity members? The, the three that we know about obviously passed through all of these challenges and were taken off island. But is there, is there anyone else? And it's, it's effectively explained that like there's only like two dozen of us left. But then everyone else decided after like the support fell off, which seems to time with the whole, you know, Han Hansha taking unanimity. They stopped support for what was going on at the island because it was going to leak out what was happening. And she just abandoned uh, supporting all of this stuff. So uh, most of the other people, except these two kids, left the island on a ship, but drowned while trying to get away because there was a storm. Now, the kids don't know for sure that that's what happened, but they assume because the storm was pretty bad. So uh, these potential other strong characters who theoretically had some of these abilities apparently died at sea, but they could still be out there. It's a bit vague. Um, but Raite is a firebender. He is apparently a pass through at least the first stage of the project. And he explains, I think, what seems to be the first stage of the project, which is he brings them down to the shore. And she, he, it, it happens kind of a bit off screen where he's like whispering to Yang Chen about what happens. So she gets down to the shore, goes into the Avatar state and just clears away the water so that they can actually go down and investigate. And they find um, these chains. So on one end of the chain, it's kind of like slammed in full, like you, you can't free it in that way. Slammed into the kind of uh, bottom of the, the it, it's kind of tough to describe, but like it's not super super deep but given that the other side is attached to like a cuffling which i think is either attached to their arm or neck i'm not i'm not really sure and um, and the idea is that this is the whole drowning part of unanimity that this is the first stage of the uh kind of like training here uh basically is that um they strap them down to this thing underwater and are effectively like the way you will survive is by unlocking combustion bending and basically blasting yourself free of your chains. Uh, with the only instruction being, try to firebend underwater, but obviously not to produce a flame, but instead to fight against the surrounding pressure and exert as much force uh, and will as you can in a single burst like an explosion and and that seems to be the idea here and there's like 10 of these chains lined up and then i think there's another one so the idea is that when thoppa says many of them died trying to achieve these skills that is the case it seems like there's a large part of these firebenders like they're implying that like at least 30 40 people tried to do this test and like what four or five people passed if even that um so you know, obviously that's on Chai C organizing this, that she what she is responsible ultimately for the deaths of all of these firebenders in trying to achieve this uh, talent. Um, and it's, it's pretty kind of crazy, but that is really it in terms of like the explanation for the thing. So they expanded into, it also involved some earthbenders. It also involved non-benders, which is interesting, highlighting that like there's there's much more going on. But that's about it on the unanimity side of things. They they don't explain to us why 
this happened in the first place. This is the piece of information that is missing from this book that I'm baffled that they just seem to ignore. And that is, how did they know to do this in the first place? Why, why would you just randomly get a bunch of firebenders and put them underwater? If you didn't know already ahead of time that it was possible for people to develop this skill. But the book never tells you how Chaisi or anyone involved in the project knows that, oh yeah, explosive firebending is actually a thing that you can unlock in a life or death situation, um, let alone like anything else. So what's the deal there? It, what was missing, I think, fundamentally from this book is that it does feel like there's like a if it almost feel it comes across like there's like a couple or a, at least one cut chai C scene that like interlinks everything together the 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 thing that i feel is meant to be a bit of connection is that um when when yang chen pulls the water across and they go down to the um the chains they find the same um creature that basically is responsible for producing the pearls which is one of the uh things that they win from chai C in the sparrow bones game so this is what confirms that this island is her island because she mentions that i got this pearl from my first dive on my island from this specific creature that only is found in the dangerous waters on, on this part of the island um and, and in a way, because of that, you can maybe make the connection of like, well, based on the first chapter of the book, even though there's nothing I think super clear, my guess is that at some point she probably witnessed one of the people from her island make some sort of explosion thing happen underwater. When like they nearly died from drowning, they made some sort of explosion thing happen underwater um, and maybe they got back. They couldn't explain what they did. Maybe they still died, but she always remembered in her head that like oh yeah that guy was a firebender and he did something crazy like as he died uh but they don't do that that scene doesn't exist in this book uh, it feels like the logical way to explain how this is a possible idea but when when this is meant to be as far as i'm aware the origin of combustion bending in avatar I expect it to be more than just, yeah, we randomly started torturing vendors and this happened because of the specific nature in which they did this was obviously to achieve a level of like, oh, if we pressurize these firebenders, it will force them to uh, do basically psychic firebending out of their head rather than normal firebending. There is a fundamental piece of information that is missing about why they would set things up to work in this way. I get what what why they would decide to train non-benders and chi blocking because it seems like there's a little bit of like we already know it's kind of found a little bit across the world based on uh, instances we've had from other content so that is fine i'm also fine with them to some degree knowing about the power of lava bending because at least a couple of avatars including zito the previous avatar were known to have used the technique and so um, okay, the, the, them sending people into the volcanoes or whatever to try and uh, awaken this ability. That makes sense. But they never in any way create the kind of ground zero moment, the, the patient zero of how did you even know that there was a special firebending power to achieve, let alone to so specifically know to achieve it in this way. And I, I feel like there's there's a few ways to do this that could have made this work. Like, like imagine they reveal Chai C was a combustion vendor. Maybe she hasn't done the full training, but during one of her dives when she was younger, she did make some sort of explosion happen herself. And it almost feels like that's what the book is asking you to take in and believe, but they never full on say it. now. Maybe I'll discover some crazy little connection in the book when I uh, reread it again for the chapter analysis videos. But I just was frustrated by this point not being in the book. Because um, otherwise it's just like, okay, you spent all this money, all this time, all this effort to get all these people and put them through so much. But how did you know to do this? And and I could ask the same question about like, how did they know about the brainwashing technique? But that's also a thing where like, well, how did the Dai Li know to do the brainwashing technique? 
and the idea is like okay like that's something where like we don't really know the origin but the combustion bending i think in particular like feels like it it, it, it requires an answer as to wait why why did you do that like what's the deal there um i needed something more um when it came to uh that particular piece of information um so um yeah, that that that's probably my biggest frustration with the book is just that there, there's that 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 key missing piece of information in this, and I'm fascinated to see if there is maybe a, a deleted scene from this uh, book. We obviously know the exclusive edition isn't a deleted scene, but I'd love to know if if FCE maybe a, approaches uh, tackling this any of this in interviews, uh, of course. Adding this one in after the fact, a scene I completely forgot to talk about, even though it's a pretty big scene, I did want to talk about. So um, one of the things that happens as the kind of uh, investigation in the island and when they meet the two kids happens is, of course, they take the two kids off the island with the idea being that, oh, at least we can save two people from the kind of torturous training that they went through. And so they leave the island, uh, the kids are on the back of the Sky Bison and they have this kind of conversation about, you know, basically like, what are we going to do with these two? Because especially um, the, the firebender boy, a pe like as far as we're aware he's done some of the training um uh, we don't really know the full extent of like what that means that makes him exceptionally valuable as an asset um and that's going to make make people kind of come after him so we have to think about this and later on when they they kind of like they land and they're preparing where to go next the the boy kind of comes up to them and is kind of like um uh are you guys going to take down Chasey? And, and Yang Chen's kind of like, yeah, basically, um, not realizing that the boy hasn't asked this as in, are you going to get the person who hurt us, who's ultimately responsible for us? And Kavik is the one to realize this at the very last moment. The boy's asking this because he's like, wait, you want to take out one of the few people that can actually sort of quote unquote pay me for... The, the valuable asset that I am, you want to just um, save me by taking away that value? And he prepares to combustion bend. And it's this shocking moment because they make it abundantly clear. Yang Chen's defenses are down. She cannot dodge this because she is in no way on guard around this kid. And so Kavik is the one to re realize this last second. He kind of tackles Yang Chen and the, uh, the the chi blocker girl down to the ground. Jujinta kind of notices like absolute last second with the kind of Yu Yan reactions and, you know, kind of roughly manages to get it away. But there's still a combustion blast apparently coming at them and someone's going to get hurt here. And this is where one of the big tragedies of the book happens. And it, it falls on like the only other avatar companion here to save the day. And that is Nujian steps in the way of the boys uh, combustion blast. And it's this brutal scene because it results in the death of Nujian. Nujian sacrifices himself to save Yang Chen. So the kind of avatar's kind of animal guide effectively is killed here. It's a hugely tragic scene because it comes out of like absolutely nowhere. Like they, they, it's not like they built up to the idea the kids are like ominous or anything like that. As far as where the kids are happy to get off the island, and then it's Kavik realizing last second that like no, this kid's been through a lot. You you don't realize how that has kind of changed this kid, and um, it's shocking when it happens because the kid is killed. Because effectively, like, a, a bison that he's just killed kind of basically falls on top of him, combined with the fact that he he's not a skilled combustion bender, and they describe that, like, he, the way they describe it, like, he effectively, like, forced um, firebending out of his head without, like, forming it in front of his head. So he literally kind of, like, pierces a hole in his head to kind of make this happen, and... It's just kind of brutal because, like, I think they described that like he is only like twelve or thirteen. So it's it's a it's a brutal scene because it's not just like that a kid and a sky bison have died. So like hitting on both kind of barrels there, you know, like no one likes to hear about children dying, no one likes to hear about animals dying, for it, both the two things to happen in the scene, and for it to have been caused by the kid kid who has been like altered effectively by this horrendous training. It's a really 
like well done scene in terms of hitting on the emotions but it is like it's it's brutal and it hits you hard and they the way it's framed here is that this is the sort of like surprise a answer to the who is the other companion of the avatar who died trying to uh, save them it is jetson and it is nujian that's what they're kind of coming to the conclusion as being now it's one of those things where like they've never full on i suppose fully clarified that like nujian thought yang yang chen airbending but you know it's a bending animal sky bison i can accept it it's maybe a little bit overthought but it's a hugely impactful moment and yang chen is is absolutely hit by this like she is in mourning for uh, a little bit there's there's some nice scenes that happen afterwards where like her team is sort of like gathered around her bed because like they have to go on with the mission but they are aware that like this is a huge loss for her and kind of dealing with that throughout the book is is a is a big 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 deal so uh, i'm gonna wrap it up there um, I, I I think I touched on a little bit of everything, uh, but there's probably one or two plot points that I did just completely forget to cover. But like I said, we'll touch on everything in the chapter analysis video. So um, yes, that's been my non-spoiler review for the book. It's good. There's a few problems with the details, but I still fundamentally very much enjoyed this book. They're my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts below. And especially on the whole... Um, the iron hoops, the chair, what way do you interpret that scene? I really want to know what you guys feel about that scene and what the interpretation is meant to be. Let me know in the comments on that one and your general thoughts. But that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.